Hey, everyone, um, welcome to Behind the Code. And thanks a lot, Airbox, for inviting me. I am Simon Dimei. I'm a designer, art director, and artist. I don't have a proper technical background. So in this presentation, I'll talk more about my creative process and in particular about my project, Drifting. Uh, so, okay, um, let's start. I'd love to start by briefly talking about one exhibition that has been central to my practice. We are in Vienna, it's 2010, I was visiting a friend and the ex exhibition Changing Channels was just opening in a contemporary art museum. It was about how artists were subverting the role of television between the 60s and 80s, how they were experimenting with the medium in an unexpected way. And during that time, the 70s, I mean, that, that time also marked the start of video art as we know it today. And in the show, there were videos, but also magazines. And there was this cultural discourse around decentralization, open source, and giving people access to the tools of productions. There were a lot of things that became important to me during the time, but there was one thing that really struck me and was this video by Stephen Beck called Illuminated Music. I don't know why I like it. It's so much, there was some mystery, some nostalgia. There was this shape that looked artificial yet organic looking. I don't know, but it was just so poetic and powerful. So yeah, I got fascinated by it. I understood it was made with a machine called synthesizer, but I wanted to understand more. And guess my reaction when I discovered that a synthesizer wasn't just like some mega computer from the NASA, but was this guy with his do-it-yourself machine. He is Steven Beck, and that is the direct video synthesizer. It is something that he built himself. It is basically a video synthesizer, it is an electronic instrument which creates and processes video and images in real time, connecting different models with chords. And the thing, it was included in the exhibition because he was like the first artist to broadcast live over a normal TV station. And it was great because the audience reacted like that. They called the television network and say, what did you do to my television? You broke it. It doesn't look right anymore. We are in San Francisco. It's a 72. So how cool is that? I mean, it was really the first time that someone broadcasted live a performance done on a synthesizer over the standard TV network. But there is another guy that is important in this story and his name is Dan Sandin. He built another modular video synthesizer, but there was a difference between the two. While the one on the left by Dan Sandin is a video processor tool, so he needed an image, an input image to start from. The one on the right by Stephen Beck, it's called direct video because it didn't require an external image. He just built an image from the ground up. Dan Sandin was important to me for another reason, because he released this document which contained the instruction to build his own machine from scratch. It was an early open source license. We are in 1976 and he was saying the image processor might be copied by individuals and not profit institution without charge. This was a great discovery for me because this was a way for me to understand how this machine worked. But it was a huge problem because I couldn't understand anything. It was really about electronics. And as I said, I had no technical background. So this kind of stuff was totally impossible. I don't I had no idea how to read it. But there were also documents that were a bit more clear. Some texts about the concept that explained how things work. So it was more like if you turn this knob, you're going to get some red color. If you turn that other knob, you're going to get a green color. So you could kind of understand conceptually what was going on. And even though I was not good at programming, I was starting to do some front-end design work. And I started 
started to feel that this stuff was doable with code, but I needed to understand better how it worked. And this is when I came across LTX Industries. We are in 2011 and I wasn't aware that a new wave of video synth was coming. These people were building modular video synthesizer designed for artists, but inspired by the tools and workflows of the 70s. Everything was analog, everything was electronic, and a lot of artists that I was following started to use this machine, like Sabrina Rate in the 2010. But the problem is that these machines were hardware, and hardware is expensive. Building a basic setup would have costed me $2,000, and I couldn't afford that at the time. But the other great thing is that they also published online some demos on YouTube where I could take a look at how things really work at. I wasn't really a training programmer, but I started to understand that I could do it, could rebuild this kind of stuff. I needed to go back and read documents, try stuff on the internet, read maths again, and then of course learning shaders, which is a language that allows very fast processing, almost real time, so very close to what video synthesizer did. I kept and spent a lot of time reading and watching stuff on, over the internet. I spent years working on this technique while I was very busy with my day job, so I couldn't really focus on this, but I kind of kept doing my experiment, building my own tools, trying to simulate these behaviors. But we need to fast forward to early 2019 when I was thinking of my proposal for Artblocks and casually watched a movie called Sans Soleil by Chris Marker and from 80, 1983. I was once again intrigued by this video synthesis and went down the rabbit hole again. What did he use to, for this film? And it was easy to find the machine that he used. It was also visible <laughs> in the film itself. And it was, well, Spectrum. The instruction ma manual was available online and the website contained a really detailed exp explanation of how things worked. After all this research and time, I came to fully understand how everything in analog video is related to a concept, the concept of video signal, which is basically voltage. And I came to fully understand this quote by video artists Budi and Steina Vazulka that we see in the, in, the, in the picture, and this was really the center of all video processing. And like Steina Vazulka says... The signal is the art material. It's, it's the, the clay for the potter, the paint for the painter. For us, it's the signal. It's the art material. The video signal is the art material. It's like the clay for the potter or the paint for the painter. So yeah, basically it's all about that. It's about signal, it's about voltage that gets processed and manipulated during the process in the most complicated ways. But how does the signal look like? This is the most simple signal, a sine wave that we are also hearing that generates this kind of pattern when visualized on a monitor. Of course, there are other kind of signal You can play with frequency to get different visual patterns, or you can do things more complicated, like using a signal to control another one. And if you know my project Spectrum, this might look familiar. The step from here to here was kind of short. The code is just a combination of sine waves, square waves, triangle waves. So yeah, to make a comparison to analog, this was a manipulation of the video signal. During my research for Spectron, I came across a video by the same artist I was mentioning before, Steina and Woody Vazulka. And it was really interesting. It's called Drift. It's from 1968. And I find it interesting that the signal was not used to generate an image, but it was used as a way to distort an existing video to create an illusory 
drifting movement. This movement will be central to my next project. But before that, I need to do yet another digression. For this new project, I didn't just want to use these simple waveforms. As a designer, I wanted to make it more visually compelling. So after launching Spectrum, I've decided to learn better how to code JavaScript. I have this cover image on a mood board for a design job and was really fascinated by the construction of these rectangles around an ellipse. I decided to recreate that with code. And it was nice because by simply picking a couple points on a circle, I was able to generate some rectangles that had an interesting visual relationship between them. And of course, this was kind of simple. So the next step would be to put the elements together on a grid. I did some experiments. I did take at some point the grid off and I started to like this kind of abstract composition of shapes. And this is when I decided to apply the movement. And yes, this is similar to what drifting will eventually look like. With that shapes, with that kind of composition movement, I started to do some experiments. I did experiments with color, with patterns with different effects and I kept going and going and things kind of went out of control very quickly. I didn't really know where I was going at this point. I kept doing experiment and I wasn't able to really find a conclusion to this. And yeah, at this point I felt completely burned out. Exploring the possibility of this project has been really fun, but after months, I realized that I had to approach this project in a more structured way. From a technical point of view, I felt I was at a good point. I've learned a lot more about coding during the process, and I had all the code components ready, which didn't rely on an external library. I had built a grid system, a tool to design animation, and a simple yet effective library to make working with Shader easier. What was missing was really a structured methodology. I was literally drifting from one experiment to another and I needed to stop and start fresh. As a designer, I went back to the basic. I'm used to work with grids and layouts, so I started by building a system that would allow me to split and subdivide a surface into subsections. I identified some combination that could work well splitting the composition horizontally or vertically or in other ways. Each of these empty model will be then filled with that, with an iteration of that algorithm that we saw before. And we started, and I started to get this. It's kind of artfully noticeable now, but the structure of each model, it's still there. It still comes from the cover of that magazine that I showed before. At this point, of course, color was missing. I wanted to do something natural, something related to atmospheric events, like a sunset or the aurora. But I also like artificial, I, I liked uh, city lights. I like light leaks and early computer war artworks on film. There was a certain tension that I was after, a contrast between something that was really natural and something that was more abstract and artificial. And one day, by complete chance, I came across this image on Wikipedia. It is just an image of tubes filled with noble gases that emits some light when voltage is applied. I kind of really liked that, and this ended up becoming the guideline for all the palettes of drifting. So after applying these colors and some light effects. It was time for movement. One great thing of animating generative video works compared to traditional media is that there is potentially no duration, no end. This is also present in drifting. New compositions are revealed at certain time intervals. In this way, the project endlessly evolves over time. 
At this point, I had composition, color, movement. But I was not completely satisfied. Even if the project started to feel complete, something was missing. It was all very cold and flat. And this is when another analog technique came to help. Video feedback. Which is basically what happens when you point a camera to a screen to which the camera is connected and it creates some kind of closed loop. I think this is something we all did as kids. And what happens is that this kind of closed loop generates a chaotic system that is really hard to control, hard to predict. And the most crazy thing could happen with the just slight change of parameter. This one in the center was one of the, my first attempt at achieving that kind of effect with code. And I kind of like this definition, a circular process in which a part of the process output is returned to the input, influencing the future behavior of the process. It's by Rosa Mankman, artist and researcher. And it's really interesting when machine takes full control of the entire process and you cannot do much but just set the initial condition and watch the things happen and really a lot of crazy effects are possible here and also raising some interesting question but this clip kind of demonstrates how things can get wild. This was by Phil Morton from the 1974. Of course, this was too wild for me, but I couldn't wait to see what would happen to drifting when I started to apply some kind of soft version of this effect. And after adding this to drifting, this started to happen. It was so exciting to see this. I didn't, I love that. I didn't, I had no longer control over the work. And it is funny because I spent months working on the composition, but only achieved the aesthetic emotion that I was after by just melting the composition into this landscape of fluid colors, this chaotic interplay of light, form, colors. It totally added the unexpected element that I was looking for. And I loved what it meant to collectors, like this tension between freedom and control, between artificial and natural, between cold and warm, between past and future, was finally there somehow. and hard anime world, but oddly soft and romantic. That was great. Thank you, Sterling, for this. And there is also a website that is combining the work and which I'm mentioning, especially because there is a um, thing called theater mode. Uh, because I really love the vertical format, but I also wanted to offer a way to experience the project on a computer display. And it's made in a way that it doesn't alter the composition and the proportion of the piece. It just generates on the fly another composition and put it side by side. And I really like the immersive quality of this. But yeah. The project was made to be adaptable for either a very small scale display like this installation or even printed or even really really big and yeah with this i'll leave you with this great video by from new york installation of artbox um the video is from jason thing thank you jason and thank you all for listening. Um, uh, yeah, hope you liked the story. And I actually believe that this process of improvisation is for me very central in my work. And probably it is as important as the final 
visual results. And of course, I'll be more than happy to reply all the questions on my channel, on the Artblocks Discord or on Twitter. Thanks a lot for listening.